This is the uh, Cocos A. Uh, welcome. It's very nice to see your faces. I hope you're not too hungover or tired or whatever. Um, I am Alan. Uh, this is Michael. And there's Stephen in the back there. And we're going to talk to you about how IPFS deals with files. Part one of five. <coughs> it's all right. They're exciting, I think. Well, that's been the feedback so far. <laughs> <laughs> all right. First up. Okay. Uh, can anyone tell me what the meaning of the word immutable is? Can't change. Yeah. All right, awesome. Unable to be changed as opposed to mutable, which is liable to be changed. Uh, so we're going to talk about why IPFS has a big focus on immutability and immutable data. In a peer-to-peer -peer network, the one on the right, <laughs> uh, there's no central point of authority, no one to implicitly trust. Uh, but in the web of today, we, uh, we implicitly trust kind of things like institutions, so certificate authorities, social media, government. Um, but that trust is easily subverted, uh, and we can't necessarily rely on the data we receive to be the data we ask for, even though we often do. Resource integrity checking is one way to ensure that data you ask for is the data you've got. Uh, the idea is to calculate an identifier for the data from the data itself. The identifier is called a hash, uh, and we use cryptography when computing the hash to ensure certain properties uh, like uniqueness and determinism, uh, but we're going to talk a little bit more about that in the next section. So once we've got this hash, uh, the, we can share it with the rest, rest of the world, these two people being the rest of the world. Uh, <laughs> And when someone gets hold of that data, they also calculate the hash. Uh, and then they check that they match. Uh, and if they do, then yes, you've got what the data you asked for, wing. If someone else gets hold of the data uh, and the hashes don't match, then uh-oh, someone's tampered with your data. So the guarantee of integrity checking, integrity checking is that content is immutable. If the data changes, the hash I generate no longer matches. So verifiability is one of the main reasons for using immutable data. In the web of today, I can put my Poodle picture up at abc.com slash poodle.jpg, uh, and 24 hours later, I can doodle on my Poodle. <laughs> so let's say I add some glasses, make him look a little bit more sophisticated. Um, so the, the problem is that the content isn't inherently tied to the address. The content can change, but the URL doesn't. So depending on when I access this Poodle, it could be completely different. So what we have on the web today is location addressing. It tells us where the data is stored, uh, but not much else. Content addressing, on the other hand, is where we use a hash to access the content um, and it allows us to verify the content we receive is the content that we asked for. Okay, caching and deduping. Immutable content completely solves the caching problem. Like, the, since the data is never going to change, the cache rules are cache this forever. Um, uh, so, back to our example, if we were using content addressing, uh, our cute poodle has a specific address derived from its content. Uh, the hash, um, and if I change that, uh, that Poodle 24 hours later, the address also changes. Uh, but that's okay, it could be verified, cached, and fetched by anyone. What if I wanted to keep both files? Well, uh, because the content is immutable, IPFS only really, really needs to store the changes, uh, the differences. The two files that we see actually share many of the same bytes, so if I have one of those files, the amount of data I have to transfer to fetch the other is really minimal. But currently, if I want to store those two very similar pictures, I need to store both of them in full on my disk. And if I want to share them with someone, and, they want both, and the, the, I want them to see both of those pictures, then I have to transfer them both in full. Um, and we'll see more about how IPFS um, does that magic deduping stuff later. OK, fetch from anyone uh, if the content is immutable. Uh, and I can verify its integrity, I should just be able to get it from anyone. Um, and this suits P2P really, really well. But that's not true of the web today. 
Uh, so I have two sites on the on the net hosting the same content. How do I know which of these poodles is the correct poodle? Well, okay, so the answer is that we can't trust that any of these poodles are correct. They are both adorable poodles, uh, but uh, we just can't get it from anyone. It needs to come from a trust, trusted source um, because I can't verify its integrity. All right. Uh, so we use content addressing in uh, IPFS, and we use a special hash called a CID. CID stands for Content Identifier, uh, and we're going to take a closer look now in part two of five. <laughs> okay, uh, it all starts with cryptographic hash. Um, a cryptographic hash function maps input of arbitrary size to output of a fixed size. Um, and we want a few properties from that hash, the same data should always produce the same hash, so it's deterministic. Uh, it should be impossible to invert, um, we, as in we shouldn't be able to reconstruct the data from the hash. It should also be unique, uh, so no two different files should produce the same hash. There are many different hashing algorithms that exist. Uh, IPFS uses SHA-2256 by default, and uh, that is just some of, the, some of them that are available in IPFS that we could use. Older algorithms like SHA-1 are broken. They're proven to not be collision free. Uh, and, if, and the problem is that if algorithms can break, we're going to want to switch that hash that we use by default in the future. The problem with switching algorithms is that given a hash, which is just a series of, of bits, what algorithm did we use to generate that hash? We need a future-proof way of, uh, of identifying the hash function used to generate a hash, as well as the hash length. Say hello to multi-hash. It'll solve all your problems. Uh, so multi-hash is, uh, is the hash, which is just at the end there, but it's also a prefix. And that prefix is one number, algo, algorithm, um, and which identifies the hash algorithm that was used to generate the hash, and another number, uh, which is the hash length. These two numbers are both variants, and variant is just a compact encoding for integers. The algo number is a multicodec, because A, it's a variant, but B, it's, uh, it's, uh, its value is a predefined value that we agree on it's in, the, in a table on the internet. The multicodec identifier for SHA-2256 is the number 18, and our hash length is 256. In binary, it looks like this. Uh, you'll see that the hash length is actually two bytes long, um, and that's because the length is over 127, and in variant encoding, uh, numbers above 127 uh, are encoded as two bytes. So you can kind of think of this as like two times 128 is 256, but that's not really how variant works. <laughs> uh, that's just a com coincidence, <laughs> uh, but yeah. Two bytes because it's over 127. We want to support multiple encoding <coughs> of data. So you've got a hash that, um, that addresses your data. When you get the data back, um, how do you know how it's encoded? Like we might, it might be encoded in CBOR, uh, concise binary object representation. It might be encoded in protocol buffers. It might be encoded as just plain old JSON. Um, why do we want this? Well, it might be a particularly compact binary encoding, so really efficient for storage, um, but it might be for convenience, might be just easy, it might be really quick. Um, but we have this same problem again. Like when we're looking at some encoded data, how do we know how to decode it? <coughs> same solution, <laughs> more metadata prefix. Uh, so this is an IPLD codec, uh, and IPFS at the moment, any, any um, any content that you add gets, uh, uh, is we, the codec we use to encode the data is DAG, I, uh, DAG PB. Um, and it is, uh, PB stands for protocol buffers, so it's just um, protocol buffers uh, encoded. Um, yeah, and it's, like I said, it's a compact encoding for the data. And we've had some uh, metadata to the start of the, the hash. Are there other codecs currently? Yeah, there are many IPLD formats okay. that you can use. Um, there are too many <laughs> 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 formats. <laughs> All right, uh, so 
there are two different CID versions, so um, that's mildly frustrating. But uh, so often nowadays, or hopefully going into the future, you will see version one as the main version that we're using. Uh, there is version zero and version one. It's just another prefix um, that we add on to the front. So all of you, if you've ever used IPFS before, you might be used to seeing CIDs like this. Um, version zero is a, this top one, and the version one one is the bottom one. Um, uh, and the ver so the version zero ones begin with kind of QM usually. Version, uh, hang on, version zero begins with QM, version one begins with BAFI or BAFK sometimes. Um, all right, so um, the thing is CIDs are binary data. Um, zeros and ones make for really long strings when they're printed out. Like it doesn't even fit on the, sli on the slide. So what we do is uh, we use a higher number base encoding um, to make them shorter and easier to like, print out and recognize even uh, in, when in string form. We have another problem again. <laughs> How do we interpret the, the ba number base encoding that this string was crea created with? Um, characters in one encoding are valid in another encoding. So we can't just look at the string and be like, that's, that's a base 32, or that's a base 16, <coughs> or whatever. Um, so how do, we, how do we fix that? Well, you guessed it, more meta prefix. This is multibase, and multibase helps us know the number base the content is encoded with. The first symbol is the identifier for the encoding. B uh, is base 32. Uh, Z or Z is base 58 BTC uh, and M is base 64. Version 0 CIDs like the QM1 you saw in the last slide are also base 58 encoded and I just told you that base 58 should be prefixed with Z uh, but they're not. If you're wondering about that then don't worry we will talk about it in a minute. <laughs> Okay, so the rest of the string after the first, um, first symbol is the rest of the CID uh, encoded in that particular base. So altogether for a CID, this is what it looks like. In binary form, it's the CID version, it's the IPLD format multicodec, and it's the multi-hash. And the multi-hash is split up, in, as you know, because we discovered it, into the hashing function used, the hash length, and the hash. As, as a string, we have the, um, the multi-base encoding, and that encoding applied to the rest of the CID. Cool. All right, so you can try this as well. Uh, if you fire up your browser and um, go to cid.ipfs.io, and if you have a CID ha happen, or happen to have one lying around, then you can paste it in to that tool, and it will pick out these properties that we've just been ta uh, talking about of the CID and show you them. There's a tool in IPFS if you've got it installed on the command line called IPFS CID uh, and that will allow you to change the number base or the version number of a CID. Uh, if you type IPFS CID dash dash help it will tell you how to use it. Um, so if you want to if you've got like a V0 CID and want to convert it to V1 and put that in or, or whatever. But anyway, I'm gonna, so I'm gonna open this up now and show you a few pre-prepared, some uh, CIDs I prepared earlier. <laughs> All right, so this first CID I have, to the start of the string. This is a Baffy CID. This is a base32 encoded CID. Uh, oh, hang on. Let me make this a little bit bigger for you. Version 1 CID. It's encoded with the um, IPLD format called DAG PB. Uh, we've got the multi-hash at the end, which is uh, SHA. The name of the multi-hash, the uh, name of the hashing algorithm is SHA2256. The length is 256, and that is the, um, the actual hash. Uh, so multi-base. As, as I was saying, is it, uh, its code is B. Start of the string is B, so that's good. That matches up base 32, DAG PB. Uh, for the multi-hash, the, co like the code for SHA-2256 is 18, as you saw on the slides. Uh, so yeah, that's, that's one. I've got a base 64 encoded CID <coughs> here. If I paste that in, <coughs> so remember I said that base 64 CIDs start with M, and they do. According to this, it's all good. So this is a, another CID V1, uh, and yeah, 
base64. I've also got one here with a different IPLD format. Oh, whoops, sorry. So this is a V1 CID encoding with base58 BTC. Uh, and uh, this is interesting because it's using a DAG CBOR IPLD format, not the DAG PB, which is the DAG PB is the default for adding files in IPFS, but you can use the IPFS DAG API to, uh, to create structures that have different encodings. And this one's good for uh, uh, like JSON data. <coughs> there we go. Okay, and so finally, the one you've probably all been waiting for, what is going on here? All right, QM. This is a V0 CID, as you can see here. QM. Begins with QM. Uh, it's encoded as base 58. But what have we got here? Multi base code implicit? Multi codec code implicit? What? Should we, should we talk about that? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, all right. Uh, cool. That's good, because I've got slides prepared for it. <laughs> All right. In the beginning, there was only multi-hash, and they were encoded as base58 BTC. All version 0 CIDs have no multi-base, and so that's why they don't start with Z. Why do they start with QM, though? Well, they are just multi-hashes. Uh, and, and they're just multi-hashes encoded with base58. So uh, if you remember uh, back to the slides about multi-hashes, multi-hashes are the hashing function plus the hash length plus the hash. And those two things at the start of the, um, the multi-hash are, are kind of fixed usually in IPFS, so which is why you see a lot of these. And, and the, it's just the, what it is, this, Q, this QM is just those two numbers encoded in base58. The multi-base is always base 58 BTC, like I said. Um, and so what else do these not have? If, uh, if version 0 CIDs are just multi-hashes, what do they not have other than not having a multi-base? <laughs> Anyone? Yeah, right. They don't have a format. They don't have a CID version. So altogether for V0s, this is way simpler. It's just, they're just multi-hashes. Uh, and in string form, they're base58 encoded multi-hashes, which is why they start with QM. Um, you can kind of think of them like this. So the multi-base is always base58 BTZ, uh, BTC is Z. It's implicit, it's not written. CID version is always zero. It's implicit, it's not written. The IPLD format is always DAGPB. It's implicit. It's not written. The hash function is always SHA-2256. It's, it's explicit, not implicit. It was a trick question. It's in the multi-hash. <laughs> uh, so the hash function is in the multi-hash. It is in, it is, it is there. Uh, the, the hash length is also explicit. It's in the multi-hash. Uh, and if any of those variables change, then you don't have a V0 CID anymore. All right, cool. So now you know how IPFS addresses content um, using CIDs uh, and hashes, and we can, we can now learn about the data structures that IPFS actually addresses. Let's get into some deep diving into how importing files works in IPFS. There are fewer people here, but I'm sure they'll shuffle in. All right, uh, let's get started. What actually happens when I use IPFS add? My file here is a tube of bits. <laughs> uh, and what actually happens is that those bits get divided up into chunks. Chunk one, chunk two, and chunk three. Uh, I'll be referring to them later. So just if you see C1, C2, C3, this, these are the bits of the file, the chunks of the file uh, that get chunked up. So these chunks are arranged into a tree structure, uh, which is a DAG. 
Uh, and so we already talked about like items in the graph are called nodes. Not every node needs to contain a chunk of the file. Some of these nodes are intermediate nodes. They could contain chunks of files. They don't always. In this example, they don't. Uh, so yeah, we've we've got uh, we've got the chunks in the these three chunks in the leaves of this uh, DAG that has been created. When building the graph, uh, we already talked a little bit about this, um, but we calculate a CID for every node, uh, and that happens from the bottom up. Uh, and that happens because we can't calculate the CID for the parent uh, until we know the CIDs for the children, because the CID is calculated from the data as well as any links it has. So if the links, if the, we don't have the CIDs for the links, we can't calculate the CID for the, the node. Uh, and so we, we have to start at the bottom here and, and come back up and at the top we can't do the top one because we don't have the one below it so we have to traverse all the way down to the to the leaf and then slowly make our way back up again uh, and we finally get to the root CID QM hash 6 uh, and so for a single file this is the CID that is returned to you and you can think of this CID uh, as the CID for your file but actually it's the CID uh, of a node at the top of a tree, which makes up your file. Okay, so let's see it in action. You can try this out in your browsers as well. Uh, DAG.IPFS.IO. All right, so here we go. You should end up, you should see something that looks like this. This is a tool that runs JSIPFS in your browser. If you drop a file onto it, it will um, draw the DAG that gets created. Um, so what we can do is we can drop a file on. Right, we can drop a file on. This is the readme from the Go IPFS uh, repo. Uh, and it will render my DAG for me. And I can hover over nodes. And I can see that on the bottom here, we've got a bar which tells us information about each node that's been created in the DAG. And, each, and we can see that each node has a different CID. And they're, they're put here. Um, the displayed here, um, and then I can change. I can change things like the chunk size. I can, at the moment, we're we're creating five twelve byte chunks, but I can I can change that to one o two four, and I get a graph with far fewer nodes because each chunk is able to have much more data in it. I can push that up to get an even smaller <coughs> graph, and go all the way. This is the default chunk size in IPFS. I just get a single node for this small file. There we go. Cool. So back back to the slides. All right. We've talked. We've already talked a little bit about this, but why why vary the chunk size? Um, so the default in IPFS at the moment is whenever you add a file, just to chunk it up in fixed chunk sizes. Um, we have a default for that, and we've just been changing that a little bit. Um, but like smaller chunks, uh, potentially because they've got fewer bytes in them, it, we've got a better chance of deduping them. Um, but it, like uh, like Michael's already said, uh, it's more work up front to create all of those chunks. You have to you have to create hash hash the data, and uh, f for the CID for every single chunk. And the more chunks you have, that's more work up front. Uh, if we have larger chunk files, then that's less work up front, but uh, easier to, like, there's fewer nodes to traverse when you're transferring the data, fewer nodes to transfer. Um, and, uh, yeah, but uh, it's not so necessarily so great at deduping. Um, smart chunk sizes, on the other hand. Now, that's an interesting one. So, like, maybe you have a chunker that chunks at keyframes so you can have better seeking in videos. How cool would that be? Or it might be a chunker that does like like very uh, like cleverly chunks the file so that um, so that if you add data in the middle, it doesn't throw off all of your. So the problem with like fixed chunk sizes is that if you add a bit of data in the middle, then everything like it throws off the rest of the chunks, and those so those chunks are now different. Uh, and so the deduping is not necessarily as, as good. If you use a smart chunker, which will uh, take that into account, maybe give you a chunk that's a little bit bigger for that data, then you can keep the same chunk, chunks that you had before for the rest of the file. Uh, and so, uh, yeah. So we have a smart chunker already. Uh, it's called Robin. Uh, you can use it in, uh, in JS in the browser. Um, 
uh, which is brand new, by the way, it's sort of like a little wasm thing, uh, which is super cool. Um, and it's in it's in that DAG uh, that DAG visualizer as well, so you can check that out. Um, uh, so yeah, smart chunk size is really interesting, but again, it's more work up front to do that work of kind of figuring out where is the appropriate bound chunk boundaries. So that's always content specific. You have to know what type of data is. Well, so Robin doesn't know. Oh, okay. Uh, Robin just takes a stream of bytes and figures it out. It's very, it's it very clever. It <laughs> okay. It, it is crazy old arson. Mm. Okay. It's been around for a long time. It's not. It's not IPFS specific. Uh, <laughs> Okay, so back to the example. Let's look at deduping in the visualizer. All right, what I've got here is a, I've copied the readme, and what I've done is I've just added some data to the end of it, so it's a little tiny bit bigger. And what I can do is I can drag and drop that on, on here, uh, and what the visualizer tool does is it adds a, a directory for these two files. So these, these two nodes directly descending from uh, the directory are the two files that I've added, the, the roots of the two files I've added, basically. I mean, you can see from the lines in this graph, they actually share almost all of the nodes, apart from, so right at the end here, so we can pick these up and drag them, we can see that there's two little chunks here and here, which are the only two chunks that are not shared by, uh, by these files, which is kind of cool. And you can see that this, this chunk, uh, if you look at the, um, Ugh, the byte size here, um, it's, this chunk has slightly more bytes than, than this one, and what's happened here is that uh, we haven't, I haven't managed to get it so that it, it, like it's, it's on a complete boundary, so there will be some shared data in these two, in these two chunks, uh, but one of them has that extra bit of data that I've added to the file. Uh, so yeah, this is this is deduping, and this is how the two two very similar files on disk can uh, it don't actually take up two times storage space in IPFS. Right. Okay. So actually, I've not told you the whole truth about this. The nodes in the graph are not just made up of the chunk of the file. And file data. <coughs> Every chunk is wrapped in this thing that we call the UNIXFS wrapper. And UNIXFS wrappers, uh, are, they can either be files, they can be directories, there are other types, but these, these two are the main, main two, and it allows, to, allows us to distinguish between what is file data and what is a directory. Uh, so it's kind of a dream within a dream. Uh, it's not just the it's not just the data; it's the wrapper, and that is that is becomes the data. Uh, so what that does is it actually adds like a few bytes of overhead to every node because uh, we've got the UNIXFS wrapper around each each bit of data. So uh, let's take a quick look at that in in here. Okay. So we can see in the bottom left-hand corner, if you hover over a node, the, the Unix FS type that that node has, and this, uh, this one at the top, as I said, they, what, it, the, what the tool does is it puts two files in a directory. So this is a Unix FS directory. Uh, and these other nodes are all kind of Unix FS file uh, nodes. And so we can see <coughs> the total bytes that make up this node and the bytes of data in this node are slightly different. And that's because there is this Unix FS wrapper. There's, there's a few bytes of wrapping data uh, that, that is in every single node. What we can do is we can change, uh, we can change uh, the leaves to using raw leaves. And what that does is instead of adding the Unix FS uh, wrapper to the, to the leaves, it will not do that. And just, uh, it will just add a raw buffer of data as the leaf. And you can see that the bytes total for these nodes are exactly the same as the bytes of the data. So we don't have this wrapper anymore. And that means that we save a little bit of space on every node we create uh, because we don't, we're not wrapping it with, with any information. It also means that we get a V1 CID. So you can see here, this is, this is a V1 CID, so these ones are like start with QM, that's a V0. These ones start with, well, a BAF K in this, play, in this case. <coughs> Why do they 
why is the CID different? Confusing. So the CID is different because. I know where the hash is different, but why is it a different format? CID v zeros, uh, as we talked about earlier, they have implicit uh, things about them. One of those things that is implicit, that is not written, that means it's a v0 CID, is the IPLD format. And the IPLD format for these nodes is uh, DAG PB. For the raw nodes, because so the IPLD format, if you remember, tells us how to decode the data. So we know that, that what this data is, it's, it's, a, it's a protobuf encoded chunk of data, and I decode it. Um, with uh, using, like, you know, like as, it, as if it were a protocol. Yeah, okay. So this, this is just raw bytes. And so this has the IPLD format, IPLD raw. Um, so, like I said, this is, now, this is now a V1 CID because it's using a, a different format and it, we, we literally, it cannot be a V0 CID because it's not a DAG PB um, encoded data. Uh, cool. So that's that. All right. There's also different graph layouts that have different performance characteristics. Balance layout is the default you get when you IPFS add. Um, and it's <coughs> really simple to build um, and really easy to traverse, uh, but it's kind of difficult to edit. If you were to change it in the middle, you'd have to do a lot of rebalancing to. Um, uh, to, to kind of balance it out again, uh, whereas like we've got trickle as well is an option. It's more difficult to build, but um, it's really great for like streaming, for example, because the time to first byte is a lot less. Like you can imagine, like if I if I have my data in this leaf, then to get <coughs> to start streaming, I need to get hold of this node, and then I need to get hold of this node, and I can start streaming. Whereas like Imagine I've got a big file, like a big movie file, and it's made a big balanced DAG. And if I want to start streaming it, then I'm going to have to get this node, get this node, potentially this node, this node, this node, uh, before I can start streaming. So this time to first byte is going to be um, much better with a kind of trickle style DAG. Cool. All right, so let's take a look at the different, the two different types of, um, uh, of DAG layout that we have available. All right, so this is the balance layout, and this is what we've been looking at so far, but if we can use this uh, drop down here and we can switch to a trickle DAG, and you can see that the layout has completely changed. And this is kind of, it makes a really interesting structure uh, if you add like a bigger, bigger file on it. Um, oh. but one thing to notice is that this CID up here, if we check it out, it's a QM, it kind of ends with CWESU. If I, if I change the, to a balanced DAG, it starts with QM, doesn't start, doesn't end with the same, same characters. Um, and this is the same data. If we've not changed the data, we've, all we've done is change the options here. Actually, if you change any, any of these options, then you'll get a different CID. So there's, there's something to note there, uh, or take, take heed of at least. Uh, you do get different CIDs if you change the different options, um, because the, 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 um, the reason is that the, it may have more or less children, and those children will have different will have different CIDs because they have more or less children. So it basically propagates all the way up to the top, um, and you just get a different CID for the same data. Now, if you've used the same chunking algorithm, then your leaves will probably still have the same same data that can be deduped, uh, but it will just be the intermediate nodes that have different CI um, different CIDs. <laughs>
include links, which I think you mentioned, which causes the hash to change, and that's the yeah. main reason. Yeah. Because the, exactly. The link structure. Is yeah, yeah. So the, yeah. Uh, so I say it's the same data in that it's the same file data that was added to the DAG, but the intermediate nodes, um, okay. they are the thing. They are the things that are changed that are causing um, the, the 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 root CID to have changed. Yeah, you're right. So, but if I understood it correctly, the actual chunks will stay the same. So you still have a lot of deduping options. Yes, yeah, so yeah. So you can imagine but, that. But it, not if you change the chunk size. Right, or but, the chunk but if you just change the DAG structure. Yeah. So you can imagine a service that takes data that was added using a balanced DAG, restructuring it yep. for streaming purposes. Yes. Mm -hmm. That would be fairly cheap. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah, that's interesting. All right, cool.